Welcome to Fosbury Flop, a podcast for the crazy ones who are not fond of rules. A podcast about the geniuses who change the world. Philip O'Callaghan is also known as Mr. Tennis Coach. His nickname describes him well. A friend told me that if I wanted to know how not to coach, I had to focus on tennis. Philip breaks with this rule because with his methods embraces the uncertainty and complexity of the game. He breaks with the traditional and linear methodologies that characterize the sport. He has a vocation as a teacher, which is why he shares his knowledge on this Fosbury Flop episode and on his skill acquisition blog. Philip, thank you, thank you very much for accepting the invitation of, of coming to, to Fosbury Flop. Like I, I, I have a lot of appreciation because you and your your alternative of point of view have brought a little bit of light in in my co- in my coaching path. And thank you very much about that. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on again. <laughs> no, we we'll, um, our... I had I had a friend who told me, like, Marty, if you wanna know what you don't have to do in coaching, you have to watch at the traditional uh, tennis coaches, how they train. But then when I met you through through Twitter, I saw that your methods were completely alternative. So my first question is that, no, at what point in your life as a coach, as a player, do you realize like, hey, something is wrong. Maybe we have to do things different. Um, I suppose it was kind of... Um interesting because I was playing and coaching at the same time so I went to university to study to be a P teacher when I was 18 and I was still playing with say, the college university team I was still trying to play in a lot of the local tournaments and stuff so um, there was a few kind of things that kind of highlighted it to me the first was um, one of the some of the best results I ever had at tournaments was when um one of my coaches said um he just set me a challenge of playing 30 sets in a month so playing loads of matches and so I did it I played loads of matches um because before that I would have just been doing kind of I suppose doing stuff to maybe build consistency like cross court forehands cross court backhands and then maybe playing a few points at the end but he said play 30 sets in a month so I kind of only did sets for that month month and I did really well in some of the tournaments that came up then after and then when I was in college I was, they kind of introduced us to games based approaches um it wouldn't have been like a constrained leather approach or anything like that and as I go that I kind of connected it with that um I suppose like the problem not the problem but and what a lot of tennis coaches would do is like they go from like one extreme to the other so they'd have lots of isolated or practices like I was kind of talking about and then matches and then as I kind of started to learn about the constraints led approach and ecological dynamics it was more that like it's not like while people think like the constraints led approach is just another games based approach it's kind of like a bit more principle so like there's a lot of activities that are kind of like in the middle so between the full game and the matches so you're getting kind of like the benefit of the bo- of both of them so you're kind of getting um like a term that's used sometimes is like you're working in slices of the game so you're working on specific areas of the game in more like game like settings so then you're learning to um what we call uh, like getting more kind of sensitive to the important information in the environment or like the fancy word would be affordances, but that's kind yeah. of what it's a, what it's about. Basically, that I think you talk a lot about the spectrum, no? That you yes. can at one side there is free play, and in the other side there is isolation or bit constraining, no? Yeah, and it's like so, you discover the middle. Yeah, and that's gonna as coaches, that's gonna where we should be spending most of the time. So, like in traditional coaching well like 
there's I don't think there's many tennis coaches that would think like playing matches isn't important. But what they do is they think that the you need to do all the kind of more isolated stuff and then you just go straight to the matches. Whereas what the approach that we take is more that you're working along the continuum and spending most of your time in the middle because like if you like the thing about the continuum so like it is about representative learning design but the key thing is like a word that i used earlier affordances and basically that's just like for like what coaches kind of need to understand for a bit of affordances it's kind of like the key information and in environment for your actions and like in tennis, that would be having opponents present, ball flight, things like that. So um, we design tasks where they're like they're playing against opponents most like the majority of the session. So probably 95, 96 percent of the session. There are some times where we mightn't, but um, very rarely. And then you design problems that they have to kind of solve. So like decision, they have to make lots of decisions and stuff like that. So. That's kind of what we what I'm talking about when we're talking about the continuum. Which, uh, which, for example, uh, recommendations or tips would you give in order to keep the key information? Because I mean, no, you, we can be hitting me and one friend uh, line all the time or cross court in order to keep the ball alive as as much as possible. But that doesn't has key information. Or well, yeah, see, I mean, yeah, see, see if you what's interesting about like say looking at that example is that if you if you were looking at it from purely an information standpoint, it actually does have it because it has the opponent, it has the ball flight, but what it doesn't have is decision making because you're constrained that you have to hit a cross court. So what that wouldn't have is the key elements of like decision making or problem solving. So like in tennis or paddle or whatever sport, like if we just get our players used to hitting cross court, cross court, cross court, that's like it doesn't help them in it doesn't help them in the matches because like you might hit the ball cross court, but then you need to realize if your opponent's recovering or not. When do you hit them the line? When do you change it up? Um when do you maybe slice it to bring them in? When do you come to the net? Things like that. So like what a key part of like having the information or like a key part of the design of the practice task is incorporating decision-making or what we, a nice way to think about it for coaches is like making the like tasks alive. So like an alive task would have lots of decisions to be made. There's problems to be solved. And like what, the big problem with tennis players in Ireland, I'm not sure, like you might see it sometimes, is that when they're in practice, they look like they're really, really good players because they like, could, but then once they get to a match, it complete, it looks completely different because they're not used to playing it. So, um, that's why we're using tasks like this to get them like more comfortable playing the matches and like getting used to making the decisions that they're going to have to make in game. It, it remember me what you said that Irish players can hit a lot, cross court, and, and look great, but then in the matches it's completely the opposite. To I think it's also from Ireland, Marco Sullivan, yeah. that he called the that illusion of professionalism, no? That the coach want to want to see super professional, super perfect, when that is only helping the the coach mind, I think. Yeah, can kind of, like. Sometimes I do feel sorry for tennis coaches because like there's a there's a lot of pressure on them to make make it look like the players are getting better in practice because they're getting paid money to coach them. Um, and if you are using the like approach that we would like the constraints that approach, it looks a bit different to what traditional coaching would or like what people think coaching is. Um, it, like it looks a lot more hands off when it's not but um so then like if you're doing a pro like if you're doing it the parents or the people watching might be thinking what well, he's not even coaching um but so that can be a problem for coaches especially if the parents are kind of if the parents don't understand why you're coaching that way then it can lead to issues i suppose 
yeah, it's curious how the, the social pressure can act, no? Like sometimes we think that the coach has to give tips, tell what to do. And that is not that social pressure is like goes against, I think, the benefit of the players. Yes, definitely. Um, like I remember I was coaching somewhere before and um, like there was a few different coaches there and like the head coach, he, like he's a really good friend of mine. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met. But he, like he just said to me that look, during during these lessons, you need to talk way more. Like after every shot, give them some feedback, give them some tips. Um, and uh, yeah, I just had to do it because like at the end of the day in that place, they weren't actually going to, they were just coming to tennis. They weren't actually playing matches and stuff. So it wasn't the biggest deal because I wasn't preparing them to play games. Um, but like I knew that that's not the way I should be coaching. What? Um, how would you combine, uh, convince your friend when he tells you that you have to give more tips to say more things? Why, um, why not? Why not to do it? Why didn't? Why I didn't do it there was because yeah. um, it was literally like a cardio tennis class where people just came to run around and. They weren't really interested in getting better at playing the game of tennis. They just wanted to be able to hit the ball. So it wasn't kind of worth. Um, it wasn't really worth worth um convincing them there because it wasn't like it, like they the players didn't want to be tennis players. They just wanted to like come do a bit of exercise. So it was a bit different. If I was working with players that were young or young players that were looking to get competitive, then that's a place that I would try to convince or that I can use elements. Like I think if I was working with say a coach like that, um, you have to do things like you wouldn't go all in straight away. You'd have to kind of meet them where they're at. So like what, what are they doing at the moment and maybe just make slight adjustments to the task they're already using to make them more alive and then gradually kind of do it more and more as they see the benefit. So like there's, I don't, I think it would be wrong to go in and be like, Oh, this is, this is the way we should be doing it. Um, Cause like the worst thing you can really say to someone is they're wrong because they're going to get defensive. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's going to be a process. Um, it won't be something that just happens straight away. Um, so if like that, if a scenario like that ever came up in the future, that's kind of the way I go about it. Yeah, but I mean, in case in that in that day, the group of players you you were coaching, it wouldn't be so amateur or more like towards leisure, and it would be a group of semi-professional young kids. Then yeah. your coaching methods, of course, that we have to take into account the context, no? What they need, how they are. But then a, a coaching method more like direct instruction, give constant feedback. Then would you adopt it or would you continue the same? More hands-free, letting them explore, so on. Um, it, it was, yeah, no, I would, like, I would have to have, changed it a bit because like I know that like like there is a lot of research that shows that like giving feedback after every result is actually detrimental to the like uh, in the sorry in the studies they call it after every trial so like every yeah. shot or whatever um that it's actually detrimental to their learning so like I think in the, in a lot of those studies about feedback it's kind of like every third or fourth shot that you're if you were giving feedback that's kind of in the sweet spot um and then like I suppose there's ways that you could do it as well that like um you could give feedback that would be a bit more helpful so like there's there is still a place for feedback in our approach but it's more a lot of the time you'd be maybe giving feedback um you might kind of guide them with a question or you might if you needed to give feedback you could give it using like an external focus of attention so like something like instead of saying like oh finish with your elbow up or something like that you could say like check the time on your watch or something like that um after your shot um it's not something that i i do too much um especially because like in the tasks that if 
we had if I had that group we wouldn't have been doing a lot of the tasks we were doing either because it was all basket feeding um, if there was semi-professional players or whatever like there would have been a lot more point play and live kind of a live situation so um, then there wouldn't be as much feedback necessary anyway I think Do you think that uh, in tennis there is a sport in which coaching in the games is very restricted? The way of coaching in trainings with more instructions, with more direct feedback, more orders, can be completely uh, counterproductive in order to then perform great in matches, read the game, adapt your game? Yeah, so like especially if the, I suppose like in tennis uh, like the, what you'll see most of the time if you're watching a lesson is you'll see a coach a player there's a basket of balls the coach is on one side and that the players on the other they're just feeding them the ball um like again sometimes like again like one of the problems for coaches is that like they might have eight or nine tennis lessons in a day and if they were the only person on the court doing more game-like sessions and they're going to be uh, they're going to be wrecked really tired exhausted after a day of that so um while there's a space maybe for like those one-on-one -on -one lessons like if if i had to do them i'd only try do them for maybe 30 minutes at most and then have another hour where the player is with another player and they're doing game like or like another player or two where they're where there's lots of different kind of situations or scenarios happening because like, i don't think it would be too realistic for a coach to be doing very game-like sessions for eight hours a day because they're going to be so tired after the end of every every day. Because you mean the coach is involved in the playing? Yeah, like that's the only way that it would yeah. work if if there's one-on-one. -on -one. If it's yeah. if if it's um, his like the coaches otherwise are doing basket feeding or something like that. Um. There are ways you can make basket feeding a bit better, but still it's not like something that should be happening for the hour of the session. I know like it's probably like 40 minutes because they're going to be doing serving or something as well for 10 minutes and maybe a bit of returning, but still it's not. Um, I think having extra players there instead of one-on-one -on -one is kind of the way to go. Yeah, so we changes as a coach Uh, do you perform in your academy or with your players? So, for example, you don't have these situations that maybe don't help you and don't help the players. Do you coach in pairs, groups? Um, yeah, so I suppose like at the moment, um, like I say my day job is a PE teacher. So like I'm just doing, I'm not like a full-time tennis coach at the moment. So um, like it's a bit different that like I guess, I kind of have more flexibility to choose the groups I want because it's just in the, like, I am not, like, like I only do it because I really enjoy it and I love it. So um, I'm not, like, what I have is, like, I'd have, and because I'm doing less hours, I can play the whole time Um, because, like, I might only have two or three hours on a Saturday and then I'd have some in the evening. So... Like, I think I have two other evenings during the week. So if I play, it's not going to be that taxing on my body. Um, and I'm still, say, 26. So it's not like I'm, not, I'm, I'm okay to do that. Um, so that's kind of one thing that's, that would be a bit different at the moment for me. If I had to do it as a full-time tennis coach, I'm a bit older. I'm not able to play as much. Yeah, I'd be doing them in pairs as much as possible um i'd be doing group lessons where there's i don't know a max of three people on a court so you can do loads of different games they're rotating in and out um and then yeah like that's like there is a place for some one-on-one -on -one sessions obviously but i'd keep them kind of a little bit shorter um not as frequent because a lot of a lot of the players would be could do two or three of those one-on-one -on -one sessions a week, whereas I'd maybe only do one, maybe two max in a week. Yeah. If if someday you come to, to Catalonia or Finland, I would like to at least make a few lessons with you 
because I remember as a kid when I was 10, my I did tennis for, for two years and the lessons were that, no? With a basket, first forehand, 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 backhand, backhand, backhand. And not even looking where the, the ball went on how I played, but to my body, no? How would you start, or, or coming back again to the key information, what do you think that is the most important thing or the main focus at the time of starting, of starting playing, of learning tennis? Yeah, so the most important thing for like coaches that are starting with like the younger players or like the beginner players is like simplifying the game, being able to simplify the game but keep the key, key information present. So like if you start, so tennis is quite a hard sport to get started at. Um, if you just give them a racket and the full size ball or like the normal yellow ball, like it requires quite a lot of coordination and the court's quite big. And if you just give people two people a racket, there won't be very many rallies or anything happening. So what we do instead is like um, we change the ball so it's way slower, way bigger, so it's easier to hit. We change the rackets. So then the task is simplified. So like the actions that they're performing are simplified, but we're still keeping the key information present. So that key information is really, really important if you're like, looking at skill acquisition from a constraints led approach or a ecological dynamics approach. So rather than like, like the traditional tennis coaching or like what you'd see in most tennis coaching sessions would be like task decomposition. So like decomposing a task is where you make the task easier, but the key information is missing. So we try to avoid that. We simplify the tasks. We keep them as, like game like as possible and when i say as possible like it doesn't have to be very game like it just has to be like if you were using the continuum like if you were saying 10 out of 10 is the full game you might be down at two or three out of 10 there's only some of the key information because like there is but like the key ones in tennis are the ball flight and the opponent so we're going to have those and then we're going to simplify the task to make it easy for them to perform and then as they get better we can and as they get like more comfortable because like I know when I was younger and even from coaching or like teaching PE in school to young kids, all they were like the children just want to play, play. Like they don't want to be standing in lines. They don't want to be like, they want to be playing. So, but this way you're still like, they're playing, they're having fun, they're learning. Um, and then as they get more better, as they get more comfortable, we can like increase the complexity toward more like the game where we might be giving them like slightly faster balls until kind of gradually moving them up to the um full or like the normal tennis ball actually all the kids i don't know what happened to you but they are looking forward to the game or the more play yet the more fun part of the session it's like the coaches we do the basket in order to live uh, calm with ourselves Okay, they are doing the right movement, but the kids is completely the opposite. Yeah, they just want to play and they really enjoy it. And like, I suppose the common misconception or like a misunderstanding around the constraints that approach is that like we just let them play the game all the time. Whereas like when you're using the continuum and you're changing the constraints, you're actually like, while it looks like you're playing the game, like they're not just playing, they're playing like there's a real purpose or intention behind what they're doing. So like um, they're getting better at the stuff, they're learning a lot and sometimes they might not even know that they are. So that's going to, and they're having from it a lot more. The, would you be, have you ever wondered or, or like if I would tell you Top three or, or make a short list or what would you recommend to a young coach when we talk about a key information no? of, of components? And here I would say that it's very dependent, no? that maybe one day we can do one basket, one player needs one thing, another player another. But would you be able to say, in my opinion, key information in tennis, it, it must have this, this, maybe this? Yeah, the only changing, like, what the research into tennis has shown is like ball flight, opponent, and then I'd say decisions. 
And if you have those, then you're very likely that the task is going to be more beneficial for the players. So, like, say in that example, if, if one player needs to work on one thing, another needs to work on the other. Like, you could, like, say if a player, one of the players needs to work on volleying or getting to the net in the game, like, you can set up tasks where, like, that player is working on volleying, but the other player is working on defending. And like they're getting a benefit from that as well. They're learning how to defend when someone's at the net, or they're like they're learning to get chased down the ball and try to get it back to somewhere where the other player can't hit a volley as well. So like it's not that you're neglecting the other player by doing a game. You're actually helping them in another area. And then after a, like whatever 15, 20 minutes of doing different like work gradually working on different games around that, then you can switch roles. And you can design a task that's more suitable to the other player, but then the player on the other side and that they're still benefiting. Like if you if that player needs to work on their serve, the other player can work on their return. Like that's what that that's what happens in tennis. Like there's you're over the other side, you're working on something, they're working on something. So it's better than them standing behind the other player and shadowing a stroke. Yeah. So I understood great, not that at the moment of starting with somebody in which tennis, let's say, that presents a super big challenge, then we have to simplify the game, no? Make it easier to play, that can get more balls, simplify the game for him or for her. And once, I guess, you have more experienced players, no? That they know, let's say, this basic of keeping the ball alive, principles. How would you, how do you structure your work? You start to giving more tips, more closer the strategies, tactics, or how to play? You continue with this game-based uh, approach, constraints-led approach. Yeah. So, like even um, even with very very good, like say, say like national standard players in Ireland, there so they're not they're not unbelievable, but like they're a good standard player. That like I'm still using things like task simplification with them because like you're again you're just you're working back from the game. You're kind of like there's some areas of the game that they're not that they need to improve on. So like for example, one player that I was working with, her volleying needed to improve. She was struggling in the game to volley. So we changed the ball to the slower ball. We kind of put our opponent at a disadvantage. So like they were over say one side of the court. So that they she had like an open court to volley into. The opponent could still get to it and defend it, but like she was going to be like struggling to get the ball back so it was more likely she'd get follies and like we worked on that for like say a good a good duration of each session for a while and then as she got better we changed the ball gave her opponent less of an advantage and so maybe I, I don't want to put like exact numbers on it but say like the first one was maybe a four out of ten on the continuum then the next one was maybe six seven and then like then we started to work towards the game and then like she was getting way more comfortable volleying in the game so like there are you still use things like task simplification with good players then um like you're still using the constraints led approach to create different problems for them so like it's not like a lot of these these things it's not like you change your approach it's just you adapt your approach to suit the players that you're working with the very interesting if if you ask me and what a tennis or a paddle player what makes a good tennis or paddle player i would say that it's a a collection of many things but if it doesn't have good mental skills it will be very difficult for him or for her to perform in a good level in tennis or paddle. How would you then start in uh, working on all of this? I don't know if you agree first. And then what's the way, how would you work these situations? Yeah, so no, I, I would agree that like the mental um, strength of players is going to be really important. So um like the way I approach it at the moment is that like there are like in our practice sessions 
because they're in lots of different scenarios, game scenarios, I'm trying to put pressure on them. You can use like, I don't know, sometimes they'll use things like, uh, like say the losers of the game have to collect the tennis balls or the losers of the game have to sing a song for the others or something like that. And then like you try, like what we try to do is we try to like build the pressure in the game so like they get used to being under that pressure a bit more it's not going to be the same as the full match or like playing in a tournament but like they're getting more like a nice term that i hear sometimes is like comfortable being uncomfortable like they get comfortable being uncomfortable um and then like what i find in tennis is like from my own experience as well from playing is that like when i went from like not playing as many matches and just training to going into a match like you weren't used to being in a lot of the scenarios whereas now when you're like you're in those scenarios nearly every single session you're doing like like we do like tie breaks where like players pick or roll a dice and that's the score they start on so like one might be on five one might be on two but you just play, that's the score, first to seven. You're like, that's a scenario you can vary. You're going to be in a match at times. How can you get back or how can you finish it? Um, and then as they get more, what I what I found myself is that like using those things, using like trying to use pressure, building, like using lots of different point scenarios and stuff in the session that they get comfortable with it and when they get to matches, it's not something new for them. And I think that has helped players a lot. I completely agree. From from my point of view as a paddle coach, I could talk a lot with one player. Hey, let's see, when, when we are in tie break and happens that, let's focus on, on focusing on, on grounding or, or some strategies. But the point in, in trainings in which I have seen that they have at least a bit of pressure is when we keep the nature, the key information of, of the game, but the challenge of the drill, it's kind of a bit bigger than them. That makes them be super focused. It's the only way I have seen. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm a very young coach, but I don't I don't see any other way possible. Yeah, I, like there, like there is space, or there is like there is room for maybe like some sports psychology or tips like that how to like cope better with the pressure but I do find that like myself that creating those situations in practice and getting used to being in them has been really really helpful because like you kind of you're used to the score being there you're used to like being up or down and like even like getting into situations that are going to be like close like like every session I'd kind of have a different, try a different kind of situation for the last few minutes where they're kind of, not even a few minutes, but the last 15 minutes, a lot of the time would be different situations where I'm trying to put pressure on the players, especially coming up towards matches. So yeah, I do find it very beneficial as well. The, do you coach in Ireland, right? Yes. And, and, and do you have a indoor court? Not where I'm for like the nearest one. There's none that I can use within like an hour or, or two hours of my house, probably. So a lot of it is um in the rain. And and how how do you play? Which role does this play? You know the fact of not having indoor courts to being able to adapt to different weather conditions in your in the learning process of your students do you use this uh, disadvantage um see the problem with is i wouldn't like there's only an advantage at times when it's like dry and stuff because like tennis isn't a sport you play in the wet um like the disadvantage that ireland has is that they the courts they use aren't courts that they use on the professional tour so they have like astroturf courts, which are really fast. Yeah. So so then there's not as many rallies and they're not used to getting used to building points like you would if you were playing on clay or if you were playing on hardcore. So 
um that's actually quite a disadvantage for the Irish players like what you can do is you can use maybe slower balls um to make the rallies last a bit longer but then they're not using the balls that they use in matches so it's kind of um that's a that's one of the disadvantages of actually kind of trying to be a tennis player in Ireland is that like they don't well especially where where I'm from there's no like other courts like they don't have the hard courts or they don't have the clay courts which are kind of the majority of the tennis year um so then they're not like developing a lot of the problem solving skills and stuff they would have to develop on clay because the points are so short do you think but that nowadays this skill to build points to have long rallies is very important i remember a thought watching the wimbledon final of alcaraz and djokovic in which i was thinking like well i would like to see much more long rallies but yeah. most of the points were predominantly serve and few shots more yeah like that is like that is a good point that like the rallies can be shorter but the problem is so like that grass court is isn't wouldn't be as fast as the courts are here especially if they're a bit wet so if if they're like a bit damp or something the ball just skids like it just goes really fast and yes. so like there are times where there's just no rallies at all because like you serve it's so hard to get this ball back um so like it can i suppose it's just a bit too much like if it, it was slightly slower and they were indoor where they weren't wet it would probably be quite beneficial but like if i was in a perfect world if i could have if i was had my own tennis academy with unlimited money like you'd have all the different surfaces they get used to playing on all of them um because i getting just playing on the one surface is a bit of a disadvantage especially when it's not used on the tour so do you think that it's very difficult no that in the tennis tour there are many countries many different uh, environmental conditions surfaces to apply it to day-to-day -day coaching um well it's more that um i don't think i think it's that's actually quite a good thing if you have access to them all that you can you like that's a environmental constraint we call it that you can use to your advantage so like having access to different courts um and stuff like that is useful but um like just playing on the same one so like the problem is like say if you were an Irish tennis player from where I am you go to play on a clay court um that you haven't played on before like the movement and stuff is going to be a bit different and it like if you're an adaptable player you can adapt a bit faster but it would still take like a lot of the professional players like what happens is like the, they go from clay court season to grass court season and it can take them a while to adapt to that um Like they have a week or two to just practice on the grass to get used to it because the movements and the shots you're going to be hitting are different. So like if you're a tennis coach with access to all the different co types of courts, th that would actually be a very good advantage to have because you can manipulate the constraints, work on different stuff on different surfaces and like develop more adaptable players. Um, I suppose the problem is when you just have access to one that isn't used as much that it, it doesn't... Um, it doesn't help as much as the others. So then uh, Ireland plays uh, against you and this and the chances of building a most, more adaptable player? Uh, yeah, well, like, I suppose there's a few things, like, in Ireland, like, there's there's not, um, I'd say the top-ranked player in Ireland is probably five or six hundred in the world at the moment, so, like, there's not, um, like, there's not the same competition levels as there would be in other countries. Um, it's getting a bit better, I think, but like the problem is that like while the like the courts is just like the courts are a problem, but there's ways that you can kind of work around them to still develop the adaptable players. But it's just that um 
at the moment, like the, I like in my opinion, the traditional uh tennis coaching or that's the approach that coaches take in Ireland. Um a lot of them it's their full time job. Um so like they ha they have too many players on the court if you were work trying to actually develop players at times. Um and then like tennis wouldn't be as big a sport in Ireland. So like that's some of the problems around maybe developing the players. But again, you can work around them if you kind of know what's going on, I think. But um it, it is a bit of a challenge. Which which coaching uh, or, or more more valuable lesson would you give to one of these coaches, no? That that has uh, many players in the court that is trying to change something, that is trying to learn. To develop better players, well, I'd say if, if your goal is to develop more skillful players, you need to have you need to have less players on the court, and then you need to like do the stuff that we were talking about earlier. Have the key information, have the ball flight, have decisions. Um, I yeah, I think if you have those three, um, like I if you only have the like I have, in my opinion. And like if I'm coaching myself, like I, again, I know that I can be a bit more picky because it's not my full time job. Um, like I'd only have a max of three on a court, um, three other players, and then you can create better problems and stuff for them, and they get like lots of chances to experience those problems. Um, and then, like I, my advice would be that they need to be playing lots of tournaments, playing lots of matches, even when they're practicing, like they need to be practicing and using different games, using different scenarios. Um, because if you watch the best juniors, a lot of the best juniors in Ireland, like what you see is they go to the, they just, after their sessions, like they're, they're practicing a lot, but they're either just playing a match or they're just doing drills where they're building consistency. So, it's kind of getting into that sweet spot of, of the middle where they're you're they're using different scenarios um to work on specific things and like getting better at playing the game. The I, I really like because I think it's something it happens in this world, no? That maybe we put too much blame in the player, in the coach, in the person, no? When what it happens is that there is an environment that affects a lot. And it came to my mind this when you were talking about that, no? that maybe one coach wants to do things different. But if he or she has her boss uh, putting 10 kids, eight kids to the court or asking him to coach what you said, eight hours in a day, then it's not possible to change. Yeah, it can be very hard. And like there are not so, like I feel sorry for a lot of coaches, not so much tennis, but they get, like it's their job. Um, but more like the kind of grassroots coaches or like the parents that end up coaching like their kids sport because like there's no coach and they're volunteering that like they don't have the time to they might have the time to learn a lot about the stuff that we're talking about or the stuff that they they want to learn isn't very easy for them to find so um, but at the same time, like I suppose it's our job to try to make the information more accessible for the coaches, make it easier for them to understand, show them how it can be done. And then like if they want to ch like you can't make someone change, they kinda need to want to change. And um, but I think if they like see the benefits and they see um how it works, that they'd be likely to change if their goal is to kind of develop better or more skillful players. This is this is what moves you to share in your personal newsletter, Mr. Tennis Coach, that I will put in the in the notes of the episode to share so much knowledge every week? Yeah, um, like I suppose when I started reading and kind of trying to learn about the approach, like most of the stuff I was reading was kind of academic papers that were behind research or like were behind paywalls, or but I was able to get them because I was in university at the time um or like books and stuff like that and like I really I really enjoy learning more about coaching but I did like I do realize that it's such a huge time commitment so 
um yeah that was kind of one of the reasons i started to share stuff was to make the information more easily accessible and to kind of help better my own understanding as well but yeah that was kind of the main goal behind it make the information easier for coaches to find which which resources not only papers or book or or maybe courses or video whatever have do you feel that have made more impact on you um so like the what i'd say like to be able to apply the constraints that approach more effectively like one of the most important things to understand was kind of like non-linear pedagogy um so like there's a very good book called non-linear pedagogy um that's worth buying um if you're looking for more like i suppose free resources it would be things like podcasts um i listened a lot to the perception action podcast by rob gray that was one of my that was kind of the first one of the first podcasts i ever listened to um some of his episodes are really really good so like go back to some of the older episodes um and listen to like he has some on like the constraints that approach a series and that and stuff like that um i'm hoping to by the end of the month have like a kind of free resource that coaches can use if they want to get started as well so kind of putting a lot of the information into one space where they can just kind of just to get started with it it won't be like in massive detail it's kind of written it's going to be written in like language that will be easy for coaches to easier for coaches to understand so i'm kind of hoping to have that done by the end of the month and that will be free as well so i'll i'll share that on twitter or send them a newsletter or something of course i completely uh, recommend to check newsletter and and to follow you on twitter now uh philip my my dad just called me because he was uh, listening the the episode live and he went to your twitter profile and he saw a, a thread and he called me like hey marty this is very interesting but i don't understand a thing and it was your thread of your five key principles for session design so I invite you to make a small game in which I will tell each principle, the title, and you will have to try to uh, explain it to my dad, which in order to make you an idea, it would be not very familiar with the topics, key information that we have been talking about. So we can maybe put some information available to many coaches that they can start uh, improving their, their coaching methods if they, yeah. if they find it helpful. So was it, it was the principles of session design or the principles it's of the nonlinear principle pedagogy? Are, yeah, our five principles, which is representative learning design, manipulation of constraints, attentional focus, oh, yeah, ensuring yeah. functional variability. Yeah. So we go back uh, one, one on one. Okay. So um, like, as I just mentioned, like, two minutes ago those are the principles of like nonlinear pedagogy so like that's what would be kind of mentioned a lot in the book so if we're talking about representative learning design like that's the first principle that was mentioned um that's basically what we were talking about for most of the podcast today yes. so that's yeah that's having the key information present and um, having lots of decisions and kind of creating situations or different scenarios in practice so uh, we can probably move on from that one fairly fast if we've uh, talked about it for most. I agree. Uh, yeah. I agree. Okay. Uh, the next one is manipulation of constraints. Okay. Of course. So um, as a coach, one of the ways we design different um, our sessions is by manipulating the constraints to the practice. So like one example of a constraint ma manipulation that we have already talked about would be like changing the ball. Um, so like if there's three different categories of constraints that we can kind of manipulate as a coach. So some of them aren't as easily manipulated. So like say environmental constraints, a lot of the time like coaches can't really change that, but like you, again, like one of the things you said in the episode, like changing surfaces, that would be changing an environmental constraint. Training indoors or outdoors would be changing an environmental constraint. So it's not as easy for coaches to, 
uh, manipulate, but it's something you can. The next category is like, it's called organismic constraints, but it's just really like the individual, like the person, the personal constraints of the player you're working with. So um, like that could be, again, they're not as, there's some are like individual constraints are going to be per not permanent, but they're good. Like you can't change them. So like they're, or change them easily. So like they're, the person's strength levels, if you want to change their strength levels, it would take weeks or months. Um, the player's height, things like that. They're not, they're not permanent, but they're kind of changing. Uh, then there's kind of ones that aren't as permanent. So something like fatigue levels, tiredness, um, things like that. Again, like I wouldn't be training under fatigue that much, but it is something that you could manipulate at times that like you're getting them in situations like you're trying to, I suppose, create a situation like towards the end of a long tennis match where they're tired and they're struggling and they're under pressure. You could maybe create that situation, but it's not something you do that regularly. Um, and then the task constraints are probably the ones that are that they're the ones that are most easily manipulated for coaches. So that's things like the rules of the game, the equipment that you're using, the um area of the court that you're using um the players that they're playing against things like that so that's kind of what manipulation of constraints we're talking about so we're manipulating those constraints to a lot of the time you'd be manipulating the constraints to create representative environments or to do a lot of the other stuff so like the constraints manipulation is kind of like an important part of the practice thing um here is that would that be okay for your dad a, a small point i, I think so <laughs> yeah, if, if yeah, not he yeah. can pause the video and okay. watch it again <laughs> okay the but then would you manipulate constraints in order so the players do what you want okay yeah good question um so the way you can uh that we kind of talk about manipulating constraints is, and like it was a mistake i made when i was first kind of starting out with the approach and kind of hearing about it was that like you were sometimes like there's two ways to think about it you can kind of like constraint to constrain or constraint to afford so constraint to constrain is like you're forcing you're using the constraint to force an action um whereas constraint to afford is like you're using constraints to make certain actions more appealing or like and you're not ruling out the other so while there's a small place for constraint to constrain at times at 95 percent 96 percent of the time you're kind of constraining to afford so you're making like the players are making decisions you're not forcing the actions on them um so yeah that was a good question what can the the main the first error that you said that you made at your beginnings it was that constraint to to constrain yeah all yeah so like um you have to do you have to do this or like you have to hit the ball. Like even if you think about a cross court, like one of the examples we talked about earlier, like a cross court drill is constraining to constrain. You have to hit the ball cross court. Yeah. So like you're not like what you could do is, oh, you get three points if you win a point by hitting the ball cross court, but you still get a point if you hit it down the line. Like there's a big difference there because you're not ruling out options. You're making them make decisions and, you're making certain options more appealing, but you're not like limiting them. Good explanation. The third principle is uh, attentional focus. Yeah, so that was um one of we kind of touched on it briefly during the episode. So attentional focus is like where your the attention of the player is focused. So that there's kind of two like there's loads and loads of research around this, but um just to kind of give a simple explanation is that like internal focus of attention is when you're focused on your the movements of your body. So like bending your knees, um, pronating your wrists or something like that, you know, it's kind of like um, the attention's on your body. Whereas an external focus of attention is generally re- uh, focused on like the results of the movement. So like instead of um, telling someone to, um like if you wanted to get someone to top spin in tennis like hit the ball like a shape of a rainbow so like their focus is on getting the ball to go up and down like the rainbow and that would 
kind of help with topspin. Um, but the because they're not focusing on their movements of their body, it helps them perform the skill. Because like what a lot of the research shows is that like when you're focusing on the movements of your body, especially if you're in a match, that it's going to result in like it decreased levels of performance. And but this attentional focus, I think it's it's very curious, no? Because I don't know what do you think about, but I see this uh, external focus of attention that we could say the rainbow, no? Or for yeah. example, imagine that you see the hair of the ball. Imagine that you cannot touch the the bone, but only the hair, no? When you hit. Yeah. But there is also the, I don't know if say more external focus of attention yeah. of hit in that place or, or perceive where is the space. Yeah. Yeah. So like, if you were if we were going deeper into the focus of attention there's like narrow external there's distal external so like you can there's different distances you can be away from your body and stuff like that and um like i think the just important things like if for your dad to understand is that like you're trying to do external as much as you can rather than the internal one basically also because in tennis what is rewarded is not in gymnastics to make a beautiful technique, but yeah. to put the ball in the right place and at the right moment. Yeah. The fourth principle is ensuring functional variability. Uh, yeah, so that one sounds a bit more complicated, but if you think about it, it's not the worst. So like in, say, the constraints that approach or ecological dynamics, um, I, like you just kind of mentioned that we're not focused on like the one perfect technique um so there's lots of different ways to achieve your task outcome um so what functional variability um if some coaches might have heard of it before is like you're using something called repetition without repetition so yes from better thing yeah yeah so what you're trying to do so if you think about it like if you were basket feeding um, you'd be doing re repetition after repetition. So you're doing lots of repetition. So like from the constraints that approach, repetitions are still important, but are you doing repetition without repetition? So like your the constraints or whatever are changing slightly. It can be slightly or like a lot every every time. So like you're repeating the process of solving the problem, but you're solving it in different ways. So that's kind of summing up what kind of functional variability is. Is like you're not working towards one perfect movement. You're working on getting to the task outcome in different ways every time. I remember now just when you were talking about this fourth principle, one picture you shared in your Twitter account that it was a, from an angle like a tennis match. It was... Yeah in the court many pictures of the same player all the movements that he was performing during the match no the same picture but all the movements and it is amazing how many different action can be uh, developed during a match yeah which they yeah, are not was, similar um, at all i think it was for it was from that picture was from the French Open. It was Novak Djokovic. I don't, I don't think it was in the final, but I think it was a semi-final match. Maybe yeah, it was a cool picture. Kind of like showed the, like, if you like the different types of shots he had to hit all the time. Like no backhand, no forehand really ever looked the same. The conditions are going to be different every time. So yeah, that that picture does sum it up nicely. And the last principle is. Developing relevant information movement couplings. Yeah, so um, so information movement coupling is like one of the key principles behind, like, say, skill acquisition from a constraint set approach. Is that like you need to couple or like you need to perform your movements to the information. So like the information that is there and the movement are coupled. So what that means is you're like you're not separating them. So you're not doing your movement in like you're not doing your movement with no context or no information there and then bring it back in you're always trying to have your movement coupled to the key information so it's quite like representative learning design where you're 
um, where you're you have the key information present. So then your coupling or your kind of like your movements and the information are always going to be linked. And then the information will kind of influence how you move and then how you move will create new information and they're always linked. So it's kind of like if you ever see a graph on it, it's always like in a kind of like circle. So like one influences the other, the other influences the other, and it keeps going and going all the time. It is a little bit the, the example that you have been repeating about the playing cross court as long as possible, no? Then there the, the information in order to move is the, the order by a coach. Yeah. When a match, no, the information in order to move your racket, hit the ball, is the position of the opponent, the decisions you were talking, and so on. Yeah, so like even I suppose like in the in the cross court example, you're still like you're still moving a little bit based on the flight of the ball because you have to get there. But at the same time, you're like you're not you're still just hitting it back cross court. And like you wouldn't be creating as much information. You're not like the information isn't as rich. You're not learning when to, like as you said, kind of like the decision. So um like if you say, for example, if you were doing a cross court drill and or if you were in a match, you were going cross court and then you hit the ball down the line and you see your player, the, your opponent is struggling, you kind of like what you kind of learn is that you need to come to the net or you need to expect a weak shot back. So like you're learning all like that information is creating new opportunities to move. And then after you hit your next shot, there's going to be new information that informs the way you move. So that's kind of like what we were talking about when we we're talking about the information movement coupling. Yeah, this information is a little bit like the same uh, spectrum that we were talking about with constraining, no? That of yeah. course, a, a, a cross-court drill or line drill, let's say, has some information, no? Position of the ball, whatever. But it's very close to the no information extreme of the spectrum yeah. when a task could be much more relevant, have much more. Yeah. And in the right context, be much more significant. Yeah, definitely. Philip, uh, thank you very much. It has been no. a, a pleasure to talk to you and being able to, to discover your, your way of coaching. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was, I enjoyed the conversation. It didn't feel like an hour at all. I think we have we have another one to do with yeah. a third guest, a second guest, uh, Kike La Casa. Let's see where he finished his English lessons and he's brave <laughs> enough to, to join us. Yeah, definitely. But thank thanks. you very much. It, it has been a pleasure. And I hope that the mission you have about sharing and, and making knowledge and helping coaches to be more functional, more independent. That also this podcast has helped to whoever who listens to be a bit more better tennis coaches. Yeah, hopefully. Thanks. Yeah, like the, the information that will be coming out in this podcast should be really, really helpful for coaches. I know you had, was it James Vaughan on your first one? I, I, need to, I still need to listen to that one. Um, so I'm looking forward to listening to that too because I'm sure it's going to be a brilliant conversation thank you Philip you are welcome whenever you you want to come again okay thank you bye bye